Goal-directed behaviour is powerful in the sense that it doesn't just get you somewhere, it also gives you a certain amount of resilience against the sorts of things that happen along the way. You can get knocked off course by events, and stuff does, of course, happen. So it does give uh, resilience, and I'll, that leads me in then to this week's um, lecture material. So when I say employability mindset, this is not just about employability, this is about an approach to life, of which the occupation you choose is going to be a major part, but it also applies to your social activities, to your extracurricular activity, your, your hobbies, your whatever it is you do in your life, this is applicable. And these principles are true over time, and they're true across cultures. So if you're from somewhere else, they're equally applicable to you. What I would love for you to do with this material is to see these underlying mindsets as being success factors that anyone can model, anyone can adopt for themselves. The way it will be expressed in any given person will be different. It'll be unique to that person, but the underlying principle will be the same. And this is what I try to deal with in this course, is the underlying essential factor that is across culture, across time. It's as true now as it was a thousand years ago and will be in a thousand years from now. What, how do I know that? Simply because I know human nature doesn't change, not fast anyway. A thousand years is not very long in terms of evolution. So for all, for all real purposes, you know, this is a whole of lifetime thing. All right, so first of all, optimism. I'm just going to say a few things about each of these factors. It's all there in the course notes. I really urge you to read it. I try to write in a very uh, easygoing, readable sort of style, uh, not academic and not 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 really uh, dense, you know, long, long sentences or anything like that. It's really just very easy to read stuff, and I really encourage you to do it. Okay, so optimism. You know, in evolutionary theory, there are people, well, there is a tendency to distinguish between type 1 and type 2 errors. Type 1 errors are merely inconvenient. The consequences, merely inconvenient. Type 2 errors, fatal. We have an evolved instinct to err on the side of assuming something is a type 2 error, even if it's not. If we don't know for sure, we might just assume and play it safe that it's a type 2. Now, that's an understandable degree of caution, and I do realise that, you know, it's wise to be prudent sometimes, most of the time. But here's the thing. If you adopt that mindset habitually, you end up passing up lots of opportunities that come your way that would otherwise be advantageous. You simply don't take them up. The, in anthropology, I may have said this last week, forgive me if I did, but uh, I love this bit. In anthropology, they say, in that evolutionary environment, it was better to mistake the sound of the wind in the grass for a leopard that might eat you than it is to mistake the sound of a leopard for the wind in the grass. So people just simply, you know, tend to assume the worst. So that then in psychology has sort of shaken down into a whole optimism versus uh, pessimism mindset. Now, let me be clear about this. There is room to be both optimistic and pessimistic. It isn't that you should be only ever one or the other. They're both useful. 
at different times. And if you're going to achieve anything like your full potential as a human being, you have to become discerning about what are the type one uh, you know, errors and what are the type two. When presented with an opportunity, you should be able to look at it and do a rational risk analysis. And if that risk turns out to be not very great at all, and the benefits quite good, then that's something that should be attempted, not simply a knee-jerk, no, 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 I don't, I'm not going to do that. So this, this, this is really the, the dynamic tension between optimism and pessimism. But as a general rule, it is wise to adopt an optimistic frame of mind. Uh, negative thinking tends to attract the thing that is being thought about and you know, obviously that's not going to be a good thing. Secondly, view difficulties as challenges. There is a conditioned mindset among many people that life should be easy. Life should be straightforward. There shouldn't be too many problems. If there is, somebody's at fault. If I can't find someone to blame and avoid responsibility, myself for that situation, then I'll just blame the government. It must be their fault. It's anybody's fault except mine. I'm not going to take responsibility for anything. Well, the fact is you have to take responsibility for your own life. Uh, and that's the one thing that you do have control over. You may not be able to control anybody else in this room. You may not be able to control me or the weather or the traffic or anything else, but you can control what goes on inside your own mind. And so the viewing of difficulties as challenges is really just a recognition that there are going to be those challenges and they are lessons. They are actually there to teach you something. And if you've noticed that the same problems keep happening to you, the same pattern keeps happening, that's almost certainly because you are not engaging with that as a, as a problem to be solved and to be learned from. If you don't learn from it, it keeps happening until you do. So that's, it's a matter of reframing that perception of difficulties as opportunities, as challenges. I'm not saying any of this is easy, by the way. It's actually pretty hard but it is worth doing because it's really the only way forward if you're going to be a high achieving person or you're going to have a decent, you know, interesting, satisfying life. This, this shakes out of modern day psychology. Uh, you know, I don't claim to be a psychologist, although I did study it. Uh, I'm double majored in it as an undergraduate but I can't call myself a psychologist because I didn't do the postgraduate work. But I do know quite a bit about it and uh, I can distill principles from the psychological literature and, and give it to you. Third point, purpose. You know, humans are goal-directed, purpose-driven human beings. All things being equal, a person with a strong sense of purpose uh, will live longer than a person who doesn't. It's, it's a clear thing. It, it, uh, even, even if somebody is ill, even if they've been badly injured, even if they're in a terrible situation, uh, the sense of purpose can really take them through. So I'll give you an example here. One of the most influential books of the 20th century was written by an Austrian... Jewish uh, psychiatrist called Viktor Frankl. Now, Frankl uh, did not get out of Austria before the Nazis really took over, and he was arrested and he was put in a concentration camp. And, um, you yeah, know, he was a contemporary of Freud, and they, they knew each other and they respected each other's work. We're talking about somebody very substantial here. Anyway, he's in one of those concentration camps, and uh, they select him for 
medical experiments, uh, which amounted to basically opening him up, digging around inside his guts whilst he was awake. No anaesthesia. I don't know what they were testing, but it was something. Maybe they were just sadistic about doing this. But anyway, he had an epiphany lying on that table whilst they were doing this to him. He realised that no matter what happened to him in the world, no matter how bad things got, he always retained the, the ability to decide what he thought about that. In other words, he was always in control of his own reaction to it. Now, that's not to say that he had to like it. Goodness me. It simply, it simply meant to him that no matter what happened, he still had that, that ability to choose. And then um, that, that case is cited by Stephen Covey in his uh, seven... Um, habits of highly effective people, and he put it like this. He said, in the space between what happens to you and what you do about it lies your power to choose. And if you can get your head around that one single idea, it will liberate you and empower you like nothing else could. We always retain that ability to choose, and that ability to choose can be to pursue a purpose. And that's what got Frankel through. He said in his book, he wrote a book about this called uh, Man's Search for Meaning, I think it was called. And he said uh, he could always tell within minutes of meeting someone in the concentration camp whether they would survive. And that something was a sense of purpose. If they arrived and they were hopeless about their prospects, they weren't going to be long for it. Frankel had a purpose and he survived. And not only survived, but he wrote this book and became one of the most influential thinkers in the second half of the 20th century. So purpose is really what humans are set up to do. We are purpose-driven creatures. And if you don't have a purpose, then you are going to be a lot less satisfied with your life than if you do have a purpose. In fact, uh, a, a psychologist called um, Martin Seligman did a lot of work in the whole psychology of happiness. And he basically um, boiled happiness down to three different kinds. He said there was... The happiness you have when you eat a, your favourite dessert, but that's a short-lived thing. You have the same dessert again tomorrow and the day after, you soon stop enjoying it quite so much. The second type is uh, to have a... Uh, to get yourself into a flow state, that is, you know, absorbed. You know, any of you here who play uh, video games, computer games, if you're so in, in, it, involved and absorbed in the game that you lose track of time, that's the flow state, and it's a good state to be in. The third and highest is having that sense of purpose and living it. Now, uh, he basically puts it this way. He says, find something more important than yourself and devote your life to it. And it's almost counterintuitive that... Uh, what would make you happy is to transcend your own ego uh, and do something for the greater good. But apparently, that's how we are wired up. And so if you have a purpose, if you have a purpose which, you know, drives you, and this could be some technology idea that you have, then that, that right there is the key to a really good life. So finding that sense of purpose is really important. Now, if you don't feel it right now, that's okay. Most people don't actually have that conscious sense of purpose, but you can cultivate it, and I totally encourage you to do that. Uh, focus on what can be controlled. That links back to what I was saying a bit earlier about you, you know, don't worry about what everyone else is doing, worry about what is going on 
in your own mind. Because it's very often the case that we worry about things and we stress about things and we spend a lot of time and mental effort worrying about things that are completely beyond our control. Uh, I saw this very graphically uh, in the US presidential situation, regardless of what you think of the current president. Uh, you know, there, there was just so much heat and noise about, you know, this guy. And it was after the fact. He was already in office. He was getting on with the job. But there are people not just in America, but in Australia and in Canada and in Britain, all, you know, just going off their brains about this, completely pointless, really, because absolutely no control over that situation. You know, and it's, it's a waste of time and effort. And that applies to, you know, so many things that people worry about. Um, this too shall pass. That's one of those things that, you know, mum and dads tell you uh, words of wisdom. Uh, it is actually quite a powerful concept that um, everything is subject to change. Nothing stays the same. So a tough situation is not going to last forever and a good situation is not going to last forever either. So it's a really good sort of mental uh, frame to simply realise that everything is transitory and to not be too attached to the good things or repelled by the bad things and simply just allow them to be what they are until they transform themselves into their own opposite. Compartmentalise. That simply means aspects of your life can be kept private so that it doesn't spill over into other aspects of your life which, you know, it's not appropriate those, that those things be talked about. I mean, people are naturally like this. You know, oversharing people tend to get that sort of reaction like, that's a little bit too much information about your private life. I don't know you that well. Um, you know, compartmentalise. Personalisation, uh, to simply... Well, yeah, I'll, I'll link that into a later topic. Just, just bear with me. Support network. Now, most of us here, if we're entering into the IT industry, are probably a little on the introspective side or introverted side. And that is a well-known phenomenon in the IT industry. Uh, I have done little uh, experiments with this with earlier cohorts and uh, consistently it's about 70%, 7 out of 10 of you sitting here uh, would qualify as being an introvert. Now that's good really because most of the creative work, most of the progress that humanity makes comes from introverts who aren't sitting in the coffee shop just aimlessly talking all day. They're actually, you know, sitting in their room by themselves thinking about thinking about things, thinking about how something might be done, thinking about new ideas. Regardless, I mean, I'm not disparaging extroverts. There's certainly a, a you know, there's, there's a place for both in society. But if you are one and not the other, then, uh, you know, that's fine to be that. Uh, there is a recognised third category, and that's the ambivert. That's an introvert who's learned how to be an extrovert when the situation requires it. So if you are a kind of person who really just shies away from a lot of social contact, totally understandable, but you do need a certain amount of social contact, a support network of people. People do not fare well completely alone. And so... It is possible for an introvert, even a deep introvert, to become an ambivert and be able to function you know, quite, quite well as an extrovert, even to the point where people say, you're not an introvert. I don't know. I don't believe that. You're far too chatty. You can still be an introvert. Um, every problem a solution. There is... Uh, 
certainly, it is certainly true that no problem is insoluble. They might appear to be. They might seem to be one of those so-called wicked problems for which there is no obvious solution. When you come to do my ethics course later on in your degree, we talk about ethical dilemmas. That's a problem for which there's no obvious solution and we give you uh, a model framework to analyse that, that dilemma, come up with a workable solution. The same, the same principle applies here. No matter what the problem is, there is always a solution, but it may need to be worked at for an extended period of time before it becomes obvious. In other words, the, the advice is don't give up. Simply don't declare it to be impossible. If you declare it to be impossible, well, then it is impossible, at least in your mind. But if you remain open to the idea that there's a solution, then a solution will be found eventually. I've found this to be true myself over the years. Even the hardest problem has got a solution. Change is inevitable. Um, in Eastern philosophy, uh, it, it is said that um, the cause of all suffering in the world comes from being attached to things that don't last, to things that change. I was just talking about this a moment ago. Uh, nothing in the phenomenal world, nothing in the physical world is permanent. Some things last a bit longer than others. This building will probably be here still long after we all have, you know, shuffled off our mortal co coils, but eventually this building will crumble to dust or be knocked down. Nothing in the universe, nothing in the physical world lasts. And uh, that applies to relationships, that applies to life situations, that applies to everything. And it's natural for people to get attached to the status quo, the status quo, how things currently are. And when they inevitably change, they rant and rail and feel bad and, you know, it's a problem. <laughs> so, you know, if you look at me, you see someone of an older generation and I can tell you that most of the people I went to uni with uh, are pretty stuck in an old sort of mindset. And this is a problem for everybody as we grow older. That's why people grow old and die uh, young, because they simply can't adapt to change. But if you remain open to change, then, you know, your thinking remains current, you're reacting to the world as it currently is, and, uh, you know, you're, you're fully functioning. And that's applicable in a career sense too. When I was working in industry, I knew a lot of people who were um, middle managers, you know, and they were in their 40s by this time. I was much younger then. They were in their 40s and uh, many of them got to the point where they left and they didn't leave to another job uh, in the IT world. They left to go and run a lunch wagon somewhere or they took early retirement. And every single one of them said, man, I'm just fed up with having to learn the next new thing that's coming along in, in the technology world. I'm fed up with it. I've, I've, I've done it, you know, 10 times already in my career and I'm sick of it. And essentially they've just, you know, signed their own career death warrant at that point because, you know, the, the industry is a very rapidly moving thing and if you're not prepared to keep up, then you're going to get sidelined and then, you know, shown the door. So the acceptance of uh, change is really a very important career piece of advice, but it's also a very important piece of uh, life advice because if you want to live to a ripe old age and have a good life well into that ripe old age, then that acceptance of change as inevitable is essential. You absolutely cannot do without that. 
Goal-oriented, now I've been talking about that a little bit already, about how goals are self-fulfilling prophecies that you simply move towards. Uh, Goal-oriented gives you resilience. So I've probably said enough about that. Decisive, some people get, uh, some people are inclined to overthink and become subject to that analysis paralysis. I'm definitely one of those people. I tend to spend far too long thinking about things before I take action. But I realise that that's a fault and I, I work to overcome it. Other people don't see it as a fault. So here's the thing. You basically do a rational analysis of that situation. You ask yourself a series of rational questions and then you gather the information you need and once you've had all of that, you can then make an informed decision. And that's, that's simply the best way to approach, certainly in a career sense, uh, your work. And, uh, well, grow as a person. I know that sounds like a bit of a motherhood statement, and it probably is. But uh, essentially, a lot of people, I think of the guys that I was talking about just now that I was at uni with, some of them stopped growing as a person somewhere about 10 or 15 years ago. And, you know, some of them are just sitting at home just growing old and not really doing very much and not being very happy about life. And, you know, <laughs> they got plenty of complaints about the way the world is. And I, I hear them and I think to myself, you know, that is, that's totally all about just not moving with the times, just not accepting the world the way it is now. Uh, just as a sideline on that before I get on the next major part, um, I, I, I've observed how in, in terms of music, popular music, every generation has its own particular music that it uh, listens to and likes and identifies with. And have you noticed how different generations are almost certain to have a negative response to the music that you like. They say things like, oh, you know, it's got to be Pink Floyd or, you know, nothing that's happened since has been as good, so, you know, what you like is just, it's just crap. You should, you know, learn from me. Um, now, I don't think for a moment that there is any more or less musical talent in the world now than it was at any other time in the past. So that the music of now is as good in its own way as any other music has been. So what's the difference? Well, we know from evolutionary psychology that when you're in adolescence and early um, adulthood, uh, you bond with certain things and music is one of those things. Uh, and so the music that you really, really liked at that age is likely to become cemented as the, um, the music and everything else is not so good. My point with this, it might seem like I've gotten way off the point here, but I haven't. The point is, if, you, if all you look at is the outward... Um, appearance of things, then you're kind of missing the underlying meaning of it. And if you want to be highly effective in your career and in life, you'll learn to look below those surface appearances at what's really going on. And that's a skill. That's a, an employability skill that you don't hear very much of. It's not in the notes because I found out about it more recently. But essentially, if you can delve down to the underlying meaning of things, then, then you know the truth and you're not blinded by appearances. And you might then be someone who says, yeah, well, I'm not particularly fussed on the music I'm hearing at the moment, but, uh, you know, 
I'll listen to it because I think any music is worth listening to at least once. And, uh, you know, if I like it, I'll listen to it again. The same principle applies to anything and everything in life. And uh, it's, it's so much... You've got it in abundance at your stage of life, but it starts to sort of ebb away as you get older. But it doesn't have to. You can consciously decide to continue being that way. But it's a conscious choice. Okay, so are there any questions or comments about, about that resilience and aspirational mindset? All right. Next we have uh, the work of Abraham.